I am pleased to bring back to the stage Leonard and his amazing jacket to talk about Voltaire rigging the lottery. Welcome, Leonard. Imagine the following scenario. You're an ex-con in your mid-30s. You're broke and down on your luck. One day at a party, you meet a nerdy mathematician who whispers in your ear, I have a mathematical plan that will make us both rich. What do you do? Do you yell out, back off, nerd? Or do you sit down and listen? Well, tonight I'm here to tell the tale of the ex-con who listened. A Frenchman by the name of Francois-Marie Arrette. In 1715, 21-year-old Francois-Marie publishes a poem where he satirically accuses the most powerful aristocrat in France of fucking his own daughter. The aristocrat is pissed. Francois-Marie is arrested and taken to the infamous Bastille prison, where he's incarcerated for nearly a year. He uses this term of confinement to pen several uh, subversive plays and poems that he later publishes under the sub name of Voltaire. In 1726, 32-year-old Voltaire is in trouble once again. He mouths off to another aristocrat. A fight breaks out. Voltaire gets the living shit beaten out of him. And then he's dragged off bloody back to the Bastille where he's given a choice. Either A, stay locked up behind these four walls for the rest of your life, or B, get the fuck out of France. Voltaire gets the fuck out of France. Uh, he is exiled to London for two and a half years. He's only able to return in late 1728. At this point, he's 35 years old. He's depressed. He's broke. He's depressed because he's so broke. But you know what else is broke in this same time period? The government of France. It seems that King Louis XIV spent the entire French budget on frivolous wars and frilly clothes, and now the government teeters at the edge of bankruptcy. The deputy minister of finance, pictured here, has no choice but to default on most of France's loans, which is going to piss a lot of people off. And the deputy minister has to spin the situation in such a way that the coming shit sandwich will taste more palatable. Uh, so he uh, makes an announcement. Uh, citizens of France, some of you have loaned money to the French government by purchasing government bonds. All oh, these bonds are now worthless. Most of you will not be getting your money back, but a lucky few will be able to win your money back and then some because we're holding a lottery. <laughs> Woo! And this is not just any lottery. It's a lottery for bondholders only. You need to own a shitty bond in order to be able to purchase a lottery ticket. And yes, you do have to pay for the ticket. The ticket price is equal to one thousandth of the original value of the now worthless bond. But if you buy a ticket, you have an equal shot of winning the half a million livre jackpot. To put things in context, half a million livres in 1720s France is like five or six million dollars today, US dollars. It's a good amount of money. And this is not a one-time lottery either. No, it'll be held once a month, every month, every sixth of the month, up to 20,000 purchased lottery tickets will be placed in a spinning barrel called the Wheel of Fortune. A blindfolded kid will reach into the spinning wheel and take out about a dozen tickets and then the people that purchase the tickets get an equal share of the half a million Libre jackpot. Uh, this arrangement draws the attention of a young mathematician named Charles Marie de la Condamine. And la Condamine asks himself a very reasonable question. What would happen if one purchases all 20,000 tickets in the Wheel of Fortune? Well, under normal circumstances, this would guarantee that you win the jackpot, but the value of the jackpot would be worth far less than the accumulated cost of all 20,000 tickets under normal circumstances. But these are not normal circumstances because the ticket price isn't static. It fluctuates depending on the value of the bond that you purchase. Now, La Condamine does a few calculations and realizes that if you buy the cheapest, most worthless of the worthless bonds, then the so 
negotiated ticket price will be practically nothing, which means that the cost of the 20,000 tickets will be far less than the value of a jackpot, guaranteed profit. Like, like imagine somebody at Powerball really fucked up, and you know that if you purchase $300 million worth of tickets, you are guaranteed to win the $1.3 billion jackpot. That's a guaranteed profit of $1 billion before taxes. Uh, <laughs> Like the only thing that would be stopping you is the fact that most of you probably can't afford to spend $300 million on lottery tickets. If you can, sue me after the show. Uh, <laughs> but like this is the dilemma that Le Condamine finds himself. He has this brilliant idea, but he doesn't have the funds. He can raise the money, but he's not really the people talking money raising type. So what's he gonna do? He's trying to figure out the situation when who should he run into at a random dinner party, but Voltaire, back from exile. Yeah, Voltaire is back in our story. Uh, so La Condamine walks up to Voltaire and says, look, I have this awesome lottery scheme and the math checks out. I need money for it, but I don't know how to raise the funds. I'm not a people person. You, on the other hand, are Voltaire. You're street smart, savvy, clever, witty, funny. People like you. Can you help me get the funds? And Voltaire goes, fuck yeah, I'll be the Steve Jobs to your Wozniak. Let's get rich while screwing over the government. Uh, Voltaire goes on a fund-raising session. He uh, gathers a syndicate of 11 investors that give him money to pull off the scheme. Now, Voltaire has a good bit of money. It's enough money to buy up a whole bunch of shitty worthless bonds and even enough money to buy some of the lottery tickets, but not all 20,000 lottery tickets. So what's Voltaire going to do? He goes up to one of the ticket salesmen and he's like, hey, I got the sweet lottery scam going, but I can't afford all the tickets. Give me some of the tickets for free and I'll cut you in on the jackpot. Now, if you or I did this, the ticket salesman will tell us to fuck off. But Voltaire is Voltaire. <laughs> and the ticket salesman is in. And Voltaire has his 20,000 tickets, which is why February 1729, Voltaire and his friends win the lottery. <laughs> and then, yeah, March 1729, Voltaire and his friends win the lottery. So normally it would be a little suspicious if the same group of people win the lottery two months in a row, but the guy that's in charge of handing out the winnings is on Voltaire's peril. So it's all good, which is why April 1729, Voltaire and his friends win the lottery. May 1721, they win the lottery. And they keep winning the lottery month after month after month. And then it all comes crashing down. You see, this is what the standard lottery ticket of the era looks like. There's a writing on it. Now, according to tradition, a lottery, lottery ticket purchaser would write a little prayer asking God for luck. Uh, Voltaire is not the praying type, and he makes his own luck. So instead, he writes witty comments making fun of the government. <laughs> he writes shit like, and I quote, long live the minister of finance, and even... Here's to the happy idea of Monsieur La Condamine. He's giving it away. And now the government is stupid, but it's not that stupid. <laughs> By January 1730, they catch on. They realize the same people are winning over and over again. And thanks to Voltaire's scribbles, they're able to trace the scheme back to Voltaire and La Condamine. The deputy minister of finance and furious, he calls for Voltaire's immediate arrest. But there's a problem. Technically, Voltaire did not do anything illegal. It's like if I go to Vegas and with a shitload of money counting cards, yeah, the casino is going to be pissed, but I did not technically break the law, so they can't have me arrested and they cannot take away my winnings. Same logic applies to Voltaire and La Condamine. The Laurel Consul decrees that the lottery is over, but Voltaire and La Condamine get to keep their money, their share of the winnings, and it is substantial. Voltaire and La Condamine each receive approximately half a million like livre each, so they're multi-millionaires by modern U.S. standards. What are they gonna do with all that money? Well, La Condamine does what any of us would do. He goes on a 10-year voyage <laughs> to measure the circumference of the Earth, the curvature of the Earth. Uh, his sciency adventures take him deep through the heart of the Amazon, which he maps out in this map. 
Le Condamine is the first Western scientist to ever visit the Amazon. He comes back bearing reports of an herbal cure for malaria and of potential industrial uses of the rubber plant. Hmm, possible. <laughs> uh, more importantly, well, uh, Le Condamine's calculations of the curvature of the Earth prove Isaac Newton's theory that the Earth is actually oblate spheroid, meaning it's slightly flat at the poles. Uh, when he publishes his results, Le Condamine becomes the biggest name, well, one of the biggest names in European science. He uses this fame to promote the usage of vaccines and inoculations in the general populace, a common sense health idea that remains popular with the people for the next 250 years until modern Americans come along. Uh, as, for, as for Voltaire, uh, well, Voltaire takes his substantial fortune from his share of the lottery winnings and invests it into a series of insider trading schemes, which are perfectly legal at the time. <laughs> and his investments take him from rich to 1% of the 1% level rich. I'm talking Zuckerberg rich. The man buys a fucking castle. And we all know that when you're that level amount of rich, you can get away with freaking anything. Uh, Voltaire no longer really has to fear the authorities. He can buy his way out of most trouble. This allows him to spend the next 50 years of his long life speaking truth to power. He writes thousands of poems, plays, political pamphlets, decrying tyranny, superstition, religious oppression, promoting representative government, freedom of speech, rationality, religious tolerance. He becomes the leading figure of the European Enlightenment, a movement away from superstition and darkness towards rationality and light. He becomes one of the most significant intellectual figures that the Western world had ever known. Meanwhile, the Deputy Prime Minister of Finance is fired for gross incompetence, which I think it's too damn bad. Yes, this man is supremely incompetent, but his incompetence led to the greatest blossoming of intellectual thought that France and Europe had ever known, which is why I would like to raise my glass and offer a toast to the one time in human history when government stupidity was a good thing. Cheers. <laughs>